I'm on the bank of the Mara River where over two million wildebeest are gathered for an epic journey. Jean Duplessis is on the trail of the great wildebeest migration. From the dangerous crossing of the crocodile-infested Mara River to the plains where he hopes to witness the largest mass birth on the planet. Just arrived in the short grass plains and with us arrived this enormous herd. The predators in this area must be thinking this is Christmas arriving. But unusual weather patterns threaten to disrupt this year's migration. In Africa, nothing is guaranteed, especially for these nomads of the Serengeti. It's one of the last great wildlife habitats on Earth. At over 30,000 square kilometers, this vast and diverse ecosystem stretches from the Maasai Mara in Kenya to the active volcanic highlands of the Tanzanian Rift Valley. It is home to 70 species of mammals. It's a World Heritage Site, and it has been named as one of the greatest natural wonders on Earth. This is the Serengeti. The name Serengeti comes from the Maasai language. It means endless plains. At its center is the migration, where more than two million wildebeest and zebra move in a continuous year-long cycle, driven by two distinct rainy seasons. They follow the rains to find the best grazing. Where there are millions of animals, you are sure to find predators and scavengers in abundance. They all play an important part in this circle of life on the Serengeti Plains. For 20 years, wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis has guided clients to see parts of the migration. Now he plans to follow the wildebeests from the north to the short grass plains. That's where the females will drop their young in the largest mass birth on the planet. But it all starts with an incredibly treacherous river crossing. I'm on the bank of the Mara River where over two million wildebeest are gathered for an epic journey, traveling more than 500 kilometers into the southern Serengeti. That journey starts now in the Serengeti. What drives the migration is rain. For the past three months, the rains have stayed in the north. But come October, there is a change, and the storms begin to move south triggering an instinct in the wildebeest to move. Their first major obstacle is to cross the treacherous Mara River. And this morning, Jean is in the middle of the action. I'm following a group of wildebeest. This group has now grown and it's constantly getting bigger. Off to my right are still streams of wildebeest coming out of the hills. Last night, there was a huge amount of rain in this area, and that's those thunder showers that's now pulling down these wildebeest onto the riverbank. This journey is their destiny, but it is fraught with dangers. About 250,000 wildebeest will die over the next year of natural causes like thirst, hunger, or exhaustion and many more will die at the hands of predators, such as lions or crocodiles, that wait along the route. They approach the river crossing with caution. They sense the lurking dangers. But their instinct to move is stronger than their fear.
soon it becomes a mad rush. Now there are thousands jumping in. There are over two million wildebeest and zebra. It will take several weeks at many different crossing points before they have passed. The Mara's crocodiles hope to get in one last feed. This was amazing. Just towards the end of the crossing, there was this enormous croc that um, got hold of a yearling and literally just took the entire head of this wildebeest in his mouth and all of them submerged. And that's the last we ever saw of all of them. The wildebeest migrate between two grassland areas, the Maasai Mara in the north where they mate and the short grass plains in the south where they give birth. They will be congregating on each grassland for approximately three months before the rain shift and they begin to migrate out. The Tanzanian side of the Maasai Mara is called the Lamai Wedge and it's unique because it has unusually high numbers of predators in the area. In the open grasslands, Jean will have an easier time spotting them. To get there, Jean will have to brave the river too, but there's a problem. The bridge is flooded. Just a few days earlier, a vehicle tried to cross but got caught in the strong currents and plunged into the crocodile-infested waters, stranding five men. Despite the danger, Jean decides to go anyway. If he waits, the area could clear out of wildebeest and he will miss his best chance to see the lions in action. Crossing the bridge is nerve-wracking. The trick is not to look down. If he does, he could begin to drift. Jean's experience serves him well. He makes it safely across to the Lamai Wedge. When looking for lions, the easiest way to find them is to look for these clearings in between the herds of wildebeest. I mean, this time of the morning, they would more than likely be moving or they already be on the kill. Um, but about an hour or two from now, it would get too warm and they would be searching for shade. But for now, we're focusing on the plains. I, uh, I would get to uh, a bit of elevation and then scan with binoculars and see if we can pick them out. Wildlife expert and safari guide, Jean Duplessis, is in the northern section of the Serengeti following the wildebeest as they migrate around the massive Serengeti ecosystem. It's October, and the herds are in the midst of dealing with their first and biggest obstacle, crossing the Mara River, where slippery rocks, rough currents, and crocodiles are some of the deadly obstacles that will claim thousands of the animals. The wildebeest that make it across will continue south and to the next phase of the journey, the largest mass birthing grounds on the planet. And Jean wants to be there to witness the births. Before the migration moves, Jean wants to observe predator behavior. The best place to see this is in the area north of the Mara River, known as the Lamai Wedge. As the millions of wildebeest cross the Lamai, large predators come out in force. When looking for lions, the easiest way to find them is to look for these clearings in between the herds of wildebeest. But for now, we're focusing on the plains. I, uh, I would get to uh, a bit of elevation and then scan. This time of the morning, they would more than likely be moving or they already be on the kill. Jean is looking for one of the clear signs of a kill, birds of prey circling above the Serengeti.
we're coming up on some vultures that's uh, sitting on a carcass of something, obviously more than likely a wildebeest. It looks quite fresh. Yeah, it's a wildebeest that's been killed and uh, it doesn't look like hyenas. It's, uh, it's more than likely lions that had their full and the, as the sun rose, the, the vultures would pick up these kills and they came to completely clean it off and eat every small piece of meat. With wildebeest kills scattered everywhere, Jean takes a closer look to see what he can learn about the predator behavior in the area. What I'm seeing here is a clear indication of predators that's not very hungry. Uh, one can see that a very small part of the rib cage has actually been consumed. Nice signs of hyenas chewing this off, but also not hungry hyenas because had they been hungry, they would have eaten this entire rib cage. This is, for a hyena, it takes no effort to consume thick bones such as this. Other things that, that point out to me are the, the skin that remains, um, the legs, and generally when, when there's huge competition for food in an area, hyenas would come in and grab a piece of uh, leg and would run off. So the entire carcass would disperse over a very big area. So this points out to me that there potentially wasn't a lot of conflict around this carcass um, because animals are not hungry. There's food all over this system. I've got some hyenas and a kill here. It's a fresh kill. They, they're all kind of feeding quite ferociously. There's uh, about five, six of them, and a lot of them are still kind of pups. Uh, what's very interesting is there's a silverback jackal that's constantly darting in and trying to take a bite. But uh, these hyenas are having none of that. And um, they tend to kind of chase him off. But a little bit away, it seems where the actual kill happened, there's, there's some skin and pieces of meat lying around. There's a big group of vultures there and the, the, the jackal is also focusing. There he's coming in now. Yeah, he's, he's, real, he's getting his head right between the legs of the hyenas. It's an it's a extremely brave act for something so small because it will just take one bite of a hyena to, to kill him. They tolerate him up to a certain point and then there's this half-hearted attempt of chasing him away. And, you know, he would just kind of scatter away a couple of meters and then come back immediately again. And there was one incident where he grabbed a big piece of skin and I think that was enough for the hyenas. And then they chased him around the bush a couple of times. Interesting, these hyenas will consume most of that carcass. They've got incredibly powerful jaws, huge carnational teeth, where when lions would feed on the kill, they would not eat the bones as much as hyenas would do that. And uh, most of the ribcage is already gone. There's so much food around, they are fat, very, very well fed. And they must eat once or twice a day. And, you know, it's easy for a hyena to go three or four days. This is definitely not out of hunger. It's purely out of greed. Not all the predators are hunting wildebeest. Jean comes across another resident of the Lamai Wedge, a smaller species of the cat family. There's a serval cat here. I, I can see it moving over there now. It's very, very well camouflaged, but you kind of just see its back moving through the tall grass. Yeah, I came around a corner and there's a open clearing in between all of these wallabies that indicated for me that there's a predator around. Now, I don't think this single serval created this clearing to possibly some lions around, but this serval is down in a drainage ditch. He's clearly out hunting and in, in these grasslands, they would be after things like mice and birds, and they've got an incredible leap. So they will have grass birds shoot up into the sky, and they pretty much follow them up and take them out of the air. Jean pushes on. He's working his way up through the plains along the boundary of the resident pride's territory. There's a lioness in a rocky outcrop in front of me. This is the perfect place for a pride of lions to be hanging out on these plains. It's first of all shady, but it's also a great natural observation point. And um, I'm just trying to, it's extremely rocky, so I'm just trying to get a bit closer and see what they are up to. There they are. 
they are quite relaxed. These must be very well fed lions. The flip side, of course, is when these when the migration moves out and the grasses are tall, it is extremely hard for lions to make a kill. She's lying down. This is an old female. I can see her ears are all tatty. Very dark black nose. I actually see two of them. No, it's also a female. She's a bit younger. It's getting towards midday, and Jean is not seeing any predators on the hunt. In this heat, it's likely that the predators are doing their hunting early in the morning when it's still cool. So Jean decides to go back to camp and start again early tomorrow when he hopes the lions will be on the prowl. So he heads back across the still flooded bridge to camp for the night. The following morning, he starts out at sunrise. Within minutes, he gets lucky. A pride of lions has made a kill. These guys are our resident pride. They are, they are living fairly close to camp. And um, they must be the most fortunate lions in the Serengeti at the moment, having their entire migration moving through. Every wildebeest in the area kind of move past here on the shorter grass. So the only thing they need to do is just lie up in this drainage area. And it's literally littered with carcasses. And they, they are the carcasses for wildebeest right now. Um, right now, it's only the cubs feeding. There's, uh, there's quite a few cubs, two different ages, from around, around four to six months. The, these cubs are now turning feeding into a bit of a game. And um, he's constantly trying to pull this carcass away from the rest of the, the group. This is it's also good practice for later on in life. Living on the Serengeti is a mixed blessing for the lions. During the migration, the resident prides eat well, but once the wildebeest have left the area, the lions have to survive on leaner times. The never-ending cycle of the wildebeest migration on the Serengeti is a story of instinct and survival. Wildlife expert and safari guide John Duplessis has been watching the most spectacular part of the journey, the mass crossing of the Mara River. As deadly as predators are, the river poses a greater danger to the wildebeest. Its fast-flowing currents can sweep a wildebeest downstream, or if the herds choose a bad crossing point, hundreds of the animals can die. Jean is with a herd in trouble. like worst case scenario, this is a very bad place for them to cross. The far side is kind of piling up with bodies and then these guys down below just cannot get out of the river because of all of these exits being, being just congested by dead animals. You know, as far as one look down the river, there's just bodies drifting all the way down and that's going to get trapped down in the rapids a bit lower down. And there's still hundreds of thousands of wildebeest coming in behind me, waiting to cross here. And for the young and adolescent wildebeest in the herd, crossing the Mara is especially dangerous. For an adult wildebeest, it's, it's one thing to cross a, a high, fast-flowing river like this, but it's a massive challenge for the younger ones. In February, March this year, a lot of new wildebeest were born, so they made the journey up into the Masai Mara and they crossed a much lower river. So they went into the Mara and now suddenly they're coming back facing these massive currents. And that's a huge challenge for an animal that's not even a year old yet. The majority of the carcasses that I can see here are actually yearlings of these young ones that just could not get through this deeper, deeper river. Also by the time that uh, a wildebeest calf reach about this stage, they've more than likely separated from their mother. So they form these little groups or herds of calves. And uh, a lot of times you'll have a, a yearling herd that will cross by themselves. And that can be catastrophic for an entire herd of that like that if they hit a river. 
that is flowing as fast and deep as this right now. And you can see there's like hundreds of vultures and storks that's kind of sitting on top of this island and is now eating these dead animals. These vultures are the cleanup crews of the Serengeti and without them it would really just be a mess of rotting bodies. Big groups of vultures like this can consume thousands of kilograms of meat in one day. So they form a crucial part in the cleaning up of the Serengeti. It is very difficult for vultures to actually tear up the, the skin of these tough wildebeest. So they have to wait for the bodies to partly decompose. Luckily we're sitting a little bit upwind from all of this because it must just smell incredibly bad as you go downwind from, from this. The crossing was catastrophic for this group. But what is bad for one species is good for another. Although scavengers like vultures sometimes get a bad rap, the work they do is of vital importance to the Serengeti. If all these carcasses were left to rot, the entire ecosystem would be in danger of contamination from diseases that go along with the rot. Vultures feed on dead meat or carrion. They can strip a carcass in a few hours. Surprisingly, it's not lions that eat the most meat, but vultures. The birds eat 70% of the meat on the plains. There are five different kinds of vultures on the Serengeti. These are the Rupel's griffin vultures, identified by white streaked feathers and yellow beaks. These vultures don't make their nests in trees, they lay their eggs on cliffs. The vultures congregate in an area 120 kilometers southeast of the Mara River. It's Maasai territory. And Jean is going to meet with a Maasai guide who will take him to the cliffs where these birds make their nests. This gorge is called Ocarian Gorge, and this is one of very few breeding sites for these Rupel's griffin vultures. These cliffs behind me are white with their droppings, and they must have used this area to breed for thousands of years. And it's the ideal nesting site for them because it's not entirely flat cliffs. There's hundreds of these little ledges that makes the perfect nesting site, and a nest really isn't much more than a couple of rough sticks thrown into a heap, and that's where the female will lay her eggs. This couple will uh, air up for the breeding season and form a monogamous pair, and together they would raise the chicks. What's quite amazing about these vultures are that they need to make daily excursions into the Serengeti Plains to feed, and at the moment when the migration is down here in the short grass plains, it might only be about 50 kilometers, but as the migration moved northwards later on in the year, it can be hundreds and hundreds of kilometers in a return journey for them to go feed and come back to their chicks. It's interesting how they handle these huge journeys. It's not like they fly there and flap their wings. They would shoot up immediately from here into a high thermal. All around this gorge is extremely hot, so very effective thermals, taking them thousands of feet up into the sky and they basically just glide down into the area the migration would be that time of year. These vultures are the highest flying birds in the world. They can reach altitudes of 11,000 meters above sea level. They are big birds. Adults have a wingspan of just over two and a half meters. This huge amount of vultures around, there's feathers lying all over this gorge, and I picked up two here. This one here is a secondary feather, and this is a primary. These primaries are going at the edges of the wings, and that's what creates a lift for the bird when they flap their wings. And it's these secondaries that will keep the bird in the sky when it's actually soaring up in these thermals. The reason why birds do preening is they fix their feathers, where they bring these together 
and they stick them like Velcro. And this will create the solid platform for them to get up in the sky. Zerupal griffin vulture is one of the biggest birds in Africa. It's uh, the second largest vulture, the only, only rivaled by the, the nubiums or the leopard face vulture. This is now where the gorge narrows. And um, when there's flash floods, this must be pretty deep. And uh, quite incredible to think about that this gorge has been here for hundreds of thousands of years. And we are very close to the cradle of man, you know, Olduvai Gorge. So some sort of form of hominid must have been walking through here, you know, getting water in the dry season, probably for the last 100,000 years. I'm uh, quite a bit up into the gorge now, and uh, this is one of the main reasons this gorge is so important for the Maasai. There's almost year-round water in the form of these pools and puddles that they can bring their, their livestock in to drink from. But they're also collecting this water to now take back to the village. And this is pretty much the main purpose of a donkey, is that they can carry water out of such hard places down to the village. Apparently this water up here is more for human consumption and the water down below would be for donkeys. It's January in the Serengeti, where wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis is following the year-long wildebeest migration. It's now been three months since the herds finished the most dangerous part of the trip, the crossing of the Mara River. All throughout that 250 kilometer leg, the wildebeest have had to contend with predators. It is a war of attrition, but the first herds have made it through and begin to push out of the woodlands. The wildebeest are now heading to the southern shortgrass plains where perhaps the most important event of the annual migration takes place. This is where the females give birth to more than 200,000 young over a three-week period. It is the largest mass birth on the planet and a spectacle that Jean does not want to miss. It's incredible. We just arrived on a short grass plains and with us are arriving this enormous herd of wildebeest and they're all funneling through this gully right now and the other side of the plain must be tens of thousands of wildebeest. The roads are clearly very wet, meaning there must have been a big thunder shower here last night and that's the driving force for the migration. There's very little instinct in these guys. It's all about following the rain and this is where it's raining right now. So last night they must have seen the thunder, smelled the rain and the water and this is why they are moving into this area. And this is generally what pulls the wildebeest from the north to the south, are these thunder showers that move from the north down into this area. The grasses here are fantastic. Right now, I'm not seeing any young calves with them, which is great for us, because uh, giving us some great opportunity to potentially witness a birth. But some of these females are looking very round and ready to pop. I'm certain in the next week, we will see some births. Now, just being on the short grass plains does not guarantee Jean will be able to stay with the herds. There are millions of wildebeests, but they can move fast. The entire wildebeest herd can completely vacate an area overnight. There are some parts of the park that are off limits to tourists, including Jean. If the wildebeest go into one of these areas, Jean would miss the entire calving season. Jean has decided to base himself at sanctuary camps in a spectacular area known as Cusini. From the camp, he'll have the perfect vantage point to keep his eye on the migration. 
Its central location should keep Jean in striking distance when they begin dropping their young. But even the best thought out plans are subject to approval by Mother Nature. Today, things are not looking good for Jean. A massive storm is rolling in, fueled by a tropical storm off Tanzania's coast. An entire month's rain, nearly 20 centimeters, falls overnight on the short grass plains, turning the entire area into a swamp. The rains have triggered the herds to move again, but the heavy dump has created a major problem. Reports say the roads are impassable and that vehicles are stranded all over the plains. If he waits, he could lose track of the herds. So Jean decides to brave the conditions. He realizes quickly this is going to be a tough day. Jean is driving on black cotton soil, which behaves a lot like ice. Jeep is to keep the car moving. If he stops, he won't have the traction to get moving again. Next thing is to try and dig out these pockets so we can make ourselves a little bit of a runway to get out. Ideally it'd be nice to find some wood to now put in front of the tires and we just need to get moving again and get that momentum. Jean has to dig out each tire. He lines the ruts with grass, hoping it will give him enough traction to get back on the road. And I think we'll just stick with the motto of momentum. Probably get stuck down the road track. Can't really call this a road, can you? Wildlife expert Jean Duplessis is following the wildebeest herds as they travel through the Serengeti on their year long migration. They are just days away from the most important event in their yearly migration, where the wildebeest females give birth to 200,000 young over a two to three week period. It is the largest mass birth on the planet. A massive rainstorm swept through the area, flooding the short grass plains. With the rain, the wildebeests have moved out. Jean is in an area called Moru Copies, where he hopes to see the mass births. While he waits for the advancing herds to arrive, he has time to explore the area's unique geology. This area is known as Moru Kopis, and the word kopi is really a Dutch word that refers to these rocky outcrops. That's such a prominent feature all around us. What it really is, is a, a fault line in the rift. Now, as the rift was splitting apart, you had all this magma pushing through trying to get to the surface, but actually solidifying quite deep under the ground, cooling down quite slowly, making these incredible boulders. And now many years later on, you have the surface eroding away and starting to expose the top of these intrusive igneous rocks. And it makes very nice refuge for things like lions. Moru is home to an unusually high number of lion prides and in no time he finds the resident pride, which is headed by two dominant males. This pride of lions have four young cubs that's about two to three months old. 
right until now has been extremely quiet here in terms of prey so it must have been hard going for this pride to even get these cubs to be two months old soon it's going to be like a massive party on their doorsteps all the time with these millions of wallabies pushing into these plains in spite of the king of the beast reputation territories are actually controlled by the females they're the ones who create the social structure raise the cubs and do most of the hunting prides have as many as five or six females and their cubs this is possibly the best time for lions to have cubs here in the southern Serengeti. All around the, the southern plains are drying out and here in Moru Kopis are the last areas with green grass. And about in a week's time you'll have all these herds of wallabies pushing into Moru Kopi, making it extremely easy for these lions to kill something and have a constant source of food. While the territory is controlled by the females, the prides are controlled by the males. In the key areas, it takes more than one male to hold a pride. That is known as a coalition. This pride is controlled by a coalition of two strong males. Part of their job is to defend their pride from being taken over by nomadic male lions. As the wildebeest migration moves in, providing an abundant supply of food, nomadic males come in as well, following the food and ready for a fight. Males are forced out when they're about two years old. They are looking to establish or take over a pride of their own. And for a lion, there is no better place than Moru Kapis. The following morning, Jean is out early and immediately finds a serious threat to the resident pride. I just came across three nomadic male lions. They seem to be about three years of age. They, uh, they've got a scruffy, smallish mane, but they are huge in body. And they uh, obviously made a kill last night, and this guy is carrying his dinner. It's a wildebeest. No, it's a young zebra. Yeah, it's a small zebra. And uh, what's interesting is that when there's three and more males together in a collision, that they will always be related. So they are definitely brothers. And even when you look at them, they, they seem to be exactly the same age, same size manes. Usually a three-year-old male is too young to challenge the dominance. But Jean thinks this trio is ready for a fight. Already by walking around like this in the open is brave. A nomadic lion, theoretically, is always sneaking through the territory of a dominant male somewhere. And that dominant male is constantly looking out for guys like this to come and beat up. Generally, a lion will be dominant in a pride when it's about age five or six even. But you know, three big brothers like this will more than likely be able to overthrow all the males in the pride when, you know, when they are only four, four and a half. These guys are so powerful that they might dominate a couple of prides of females, you know, and especially like an area like Moru Kopis, where you've got so much diversity and landscape. There's, there's quite a few prides of females in a fairly small area, and they can quite easily become dominant over two or three prides of females, making them, of course, very powerful. It's rare in the Serengeti that the male lion gets much older than, than 10 at a push 12. And it's quite common that, that a lion in a zoo can, can reach age 20, 25. You know, there's even a, a lion in, in Germany in a zoo that's age 40. But um, out here in the wild where they need to really work for a life, that, um, that cuts a few years off their lives. When a new male takes over the pride, he kills all the cubs to make room for his own. With these cubs already a few months old, the females are counting on the two males for the survival of the pride. If the three males challenge, it will be a long night in Muru copies.
After a noisy night, Jean heads out before sunrise. He's greeted by an incredible sight. Where did they come from so quickly? I'm out here on the short grass plains and overnight, hundreds of thousands of wildebeest just appeared. Um, yesterday there was very little around and today suddenly they're everywhere. I mean, as far as I can see, it just looks like pepper. There's hundreds of thousands even. This is good news for Jean. For a while, it looked like the wildebeest herds were heading towards protected land that is off limits. It would mean that he would not be able to witness the mass births. And uh, our objective still is to find a female giving birth. Right now, there's no calves around, which is a very good sign for us, because once the calving starts, it's a very rapid process. And these females were, will all be dropping their calves to, um, I guess, flood the market. There would just be too many calves or predators to take advantage of. Jean is not the only one out cruising the herds. He finds the dominant male lions, but by the looks of them, there was an epic battle during the night. They had both beaten up quite badly. The one had a real messed up eye, and the other one had quite a bad limp. They may look badly injured, and they've lost a lot of fur around their manes, but they seem to have won the fight against the nomadic males. If a dominant male will get injured in a fight, um, you know, he's extremely fortunate to be dominant inside a pride because these females will continue to hunt and he can benefit from their efforts and the food that they catch. There's five lionesses walking through the herd. This is kind of classic lion hunting behavior in the migration as they are looking for anything that might be injured. That's just easy pickings and it's almost like, why expel any energy if you don't have to? We're in the calving season, and um, generally female wildebeest will give birth before 10 o'clock in the morning. And obviously when that baby is born, it's very, very vulnerable. So these lions are kind of fanned out. I'm certain they're either looking for a female giving birth or a young one that was just born. So these lions didn't make a kill, um, but they are, they are not very well fed. So uh, they will definitely have to hunt within the next 12 hours, probably later this afternoon when it cools down again. And I suspect now they're heading into one of these copies where the wildebeest will also need to drink during the day. And they're probably gonna lie up there and hope for a better chance later. Wildlife expert Jean Duplessis has been following the great wildebeest migration since October when the two million animals made their deadly and dangerous crossing of the Mara River, where thousands died. It's now February, and the survivors have made it to the short grass plains, where the females are about to give birth. It is a true phenomenon of the natural world, the largest mass birth on the planet. We just got a call from one of our drivers saying that he's with two wildebeest that are giving birth. So um, we're just trying to race to get there because it's, once it starts, it's quite quick for it to, to happen. It's interesting that wildebeest will only give birth up until about 10 o'clock in the morning because the baby will need the rest of the day to get strong to be running by nightfall and escaping predators. Jean makes it to the area where his guide and clients have a front row seat. We just passed a female with her leg sticking out of her, so there's a birth about to happen. Yeah, she found a flat patch and she's just kind of circling around. They, they, they tend to prefer an area, you know, that doesn't have a huge amount of tall grass. She's chosen the safety of the herd to give birth for obvious reasons. You know, this, this uh, young calf coming out is extremely vulnerable. Hyenas, lions, and all kinds of predators are out on the prowl this time of the morning. And they are keeping a watchful eye out for something just like this. Yeah, it's gonna happen any moment now. 
There you go. She just stood back up. And yeah, that, that's like having gravity help her. But then there the baby drops. It's incredible. She's just coming around, sniffing on the baby now. It's amazing how quickly this all happens. Yeah, it's about five to ten minutes now, and uh, the baby is starting to move around a bit more. And it's, it's kind of trying to stand up, pushing it up on its hind legs, but very off balance still. You know, this, this, this young guy will be ready to go in the next five minutes. You know, ten minutes later, ready to run with his mum. Because now hyenas are really watching out for young calves falling over like that and they would be here in a flash if they can see it. There you go, a new generation starting all over. In a few months time this baby would even be strong enough to, to start up the migration up north and by July, August, even cross the Mara River. It's incredible to think that that little thing just, just born there, so, so helpless, in six months' time will be crossing huge rivers full of crocodiles that's like 12, 13 feet long. You know, and besides that, of course, they also have to travel 400 kilometers to get there through hyena and lion infested savannah. For just over three months, Jean has been following the first leg of one of the greatest journeys in nature, the wildebeest migration. From the crossing of the Mara River to the mass birthing grounds, the millions of animals are in constant motion. Their movement is crucial to the Serengeti ecosystem. Everything in it thrives off their impact from the grasses, insects, to the birds and predators. Everything is connected, defining the circle of life on the Serengeti.